So we've had uh, in the past comments that say, we'd like to get to know the candidates a little better. And I'm like, well, we could give them 10 minutes features, 20 minutes features. We could make the day that. Um, we actually decided just for the Board of Trustees, we're gonna do a candidate forum. And this is a little pre-canned, because uh, this is our first foray. We're gonna actually ask each of the candidates a question and have each respond. Um, I'm gonna moderate the session. We have, for the one candidate who can't be here, uh, Jacob, we actually have uh, his responses already taped by video. Um, you are actually the ones who supplied the questions. I actually, we polled the community, uh, both for the questions and for the order of the questions, a priority, because we had far more questions than time allows. So we're gonna take about 30 minutes and do this. Um, it's uh, to allow you to get a better understanding of the Board of Trustees and uh, why, they're, uh, why they might be of interest to the community. Uh, we announced the questions, uh, we sourced them from the community, we announced them back to you and let you prioritize. You can see everyone's questions. Uh, I grabbed the short list based on that priority. We'll take three or four of them, which we've prepared, depending on how the time goes. And uh, there's not going to be a Q&A. So each candidate has about two minutes to respond to each question. I'll pose it to each one of them. Then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, there's no Q&A, but we're going from here to break. And so, I mean, unless the candidate's really sneaky, I think you'll be able to find them out there somehow. Uh, so you can always find them one-on-one -on -one if you have to follow up. Um, and a candidate doesn't want to answer a question. It may be that it's a question that they, they haven't thought about uh, or they, they don't think the answer really fits in two minutes. They don't need to answer a question. And uh, we'll see how it goes. And then we'll take, as always, uh, we'll think about this how we do it in the future. But as a first foray, um, this is what we're gonna uh, proceed with. So, at this time I will ask all the candidates to come up here. They have seats assigned. Welcome to our first candidate forum. I'm gonna ask each of you, uh, and of course, uh, remote, uh, Jacob, I'm going to ask uh, each of you a question. Uh, the first question is the one before us, which is, what do you think Aaron can do to improve the general internet's routing security policy? And um, I'll, I'll open it up immediately. If one of you wants to go first and kick off the forum, uh, I'll turn it over to one of you. Who wants to go first? If Bill, go right ahead. All right. First of all, I want to say congratulations to everyone for making it through the NOMCOM process, and I'm really honored to be uh, a candidate with such an esteemed crop of uh, individuals. So, welcome. All right. So, with regard to this particular question uh, and Aaron improving the general internet's uh, routing security policy. Uh, my view is that Aaron should share, along with its other industry partners, RIRs, uh, ICANN, etc., a leading role in improving the internet's routing security. There are a variety of ways in which this can be done, but mostly through advocacy and outreach, uh, as well as education around initiatives like MANNERS, the mutually agreed upon norms for routing and security, uh, in particular where it relates to BTPSEC and RPKI. So to summarize, I, I think our role is to lead with others um, in an advocacy and, and outreach initiatives. Excellent. I'm gonna now turn it over to our remote video. If we can hear from Jacob, uh, Jacob Glick, on the question of how we can improve the uh, internet's routing security policy. Coming up. I could tell a joke. Oh. <laughs> you didn't like your joke, John. It's actually good. Go ahead. Like 
near and do to improve Ethernet's routing security policy. You know, for me, I think that the key is for any organization, especially a venerable one like Aaron, to be open to new and innovative developments that increase security. So that includes exploring new technologies, piloting them, really being a champion for security across the web, but importantly, not letting security be a Trojan horse for the balkanization or the shutting down of the open web. Okay. Um, another board member would like to go next? Go right ahead. There we go. Um, so this morning we, we heard and very much enjoyed, I think, Kathy Aronson's presentation on uh, what's happening at the most recent ITF, uh, among which was a slide on CIDR Ops, um, which promotes deployment of things like RPKI and, and BGPSEC. Point being, there's kind of a wider world out there of, of, of this stuff. And so, you know, the question of where Aaron fits in, I think, is an is a important and tricky one. Um, let me start with some ideas and then retreat back to activities. You know, things like Aaron on the road have, I think, a lot of potential to go even further, focus down, call it, you know, routing security on the road and actually reach out to ISPs when doing it and, you know, say, like, you know, let's talk specifically about deploying some of this stuff. Um, meeting with non-adopters, um, adding routing security as a heading in the RIR comparative policy overview simply. So to have that discipline of kind of checking in each time on what everyone's doing. Um, publishing deployment numbers to see how we're doing, um, all of which are hopefully fairly light touch activities because Aaron's resources are limited. Um, you know, Aaron already does much in the area of routing security, IRR, RPKI, as well as things like DNSSEC and RDNS. And, you know, I guess in my view, the primary job is to tighten, improve, and increase deployment of, of, of existing activities, much of which has already been going, been going on, much of which has already been the subject of a lot of work. So I think the, the next step will, will surely be to look at what the results have been from the IRR uh, uh, forklift upgrade from uh, the change to the agreement uh, around, um, well, around RPKI and uh, see how we did. Okay. Um, thank you, Bram. Uh, would either of the other candidates like to, <coughs> Patrick or Catherine? I see Patrick. <laughs> Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> We'll do all the Canadians at once. And then. <laughs> so I'm new to the organization. I, I think in some ways this is a general question, but I, I think it could also refer to quite a specific I, um, instance or a, a, an issue that's, that's happening at the moment. So I was looking around um, for some information to help me understand this better. And one of the things I came across was an article in the register that you've probably seen published a couple of days ago with the headline, Critical Internet Org Accused of Undercutting Security Over Legal Fears, America's Regional Internet Registry Slammed by Critics, Snubbed by ISPs. So I don't know how accurate the story is. I am, but the story's out there. And from a governance perspective, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of somebody on the board of trustees or potentially wishing to be on the board of trustees. I, I think it matters that the story is there. I, I think it matters that the story reflects there's a lack of consensus. I am, it, there, there is a huge amount to this issue and as a novice I'm really going out on a limb sort of jumping in. I am, but I think really what's important here is looking for the commonalities, trying to figure out how collectively the organization, Aaron as an organization, and the community it serves can figure out a way to solve this problem. That there is a recognition that RPKI is really important, there's a current set of roadblocks, and thinking about how those, uh, how perhaps meeting in the middle, how those can, uh, how the concerns can be addressed ultimately. Okay. Patrick, do you want to? Opine on uh, sure. what Aaron should do to improve general Internet's routing security policy. So uh, I'm going to start with a couple of things that, um, that you might not think about. So the first one is you say, what uh, can Aaron do? And I think the first question actually is, should Aaron do anything? Um, most of you have been, some of you have been around for a long time, but I don't know if you remember, Aaron originally didn't even guarantee your blocks were routable. In fact, I'm not sure we still do. Um, so the idea that Aaron 
takes an operational role is kind of new. But I do think that's an okay pivot for Aaron to do. I think that um, routing security is very important, uh, and I think that if we can help, that's fine for us to do. The second thing that is not clear by the question is uh, you're asking a bunch of board candidates what we do on a policy issue, and the board doesn't dictate policy. This should be something that goes through the standard PDP, and the community should have a voice in this. But because the question was answered, I'm happy to give you my opinion because I'm a member of the community and I'm allowed to say these things. But I wanted to be clear that like, if somebody came to the board and said put this policy in, my first reaction would be has it gone through the PDP? Did the AC and the community comment on it, et cetera, et cetera. So given that, um, like everybody else here, I think you know, the IRR and the RPKI are good starts. Um, but they are just starts. Um, uh, I don't think RPKI is a silver bullet, but it's you know, a necessary baby step. There is no silver bullet, so do a defense in depth strategy and start with several different things. But they, more importantly, are an example of how Aaron can help. Um, we have no ability to affect any router on the DFC. There's nothing, you know, Aaron doesn't have any operational capabilities. All we can do is, as a for instance, publish a list of things or people that are ASNs that have done bad stuff and hope that the operators use that list to create better security on their own stuff. So I think thinking up things like that are good and tightening what we have. Just as an example, we have an IRR, but let's all be honest with each other. The IRR is not the greatest thing that ever existed, right? It's not verified. There's lots of trash in it. We didn't do any work with it. RPKI is a better example where you have to actually verify who you are before you can say you own a block. So I'd like to see us do those things, but I'd like to see it come from the community. And I'm happy to participate in those discussions, but as a board member, I'm certainly not going to force anything through that hasn't been through the standard process. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to our next question now. Our next question is, why do you wanna serve on the Board of Trustees? A question you've all somewhat answered when you gave your bio. I wanna focus on the second part. What's your motivation to give up so much personal time? Um, Patrick, go ahead. Um, so like I said in my speech, I've been incredibly lucky um, to be able to participate in lots of things. I've had jobs that let me get on nonprofit boards for internet infrastructure and policy uh, organizations and I didn't have to give up uh, vacation time or anything like that. I was also really, really lucky in that I had a bunch of friends and colleagues who helped support me so that I could you know, learn how to do it right and make a real impact. And my role at Aaron is um, honestly kind of a culmination of all that experience. Um, I, I feel I can contribute to the community. I feel like I'm making a positive impact on the internet. And I honestly believe the work we do is important to the growth of the internet. And by extension, as silly or perhaps as arrogant as it sounds, the internet has made life better for literally billions of people. So I want you all to stop and think about this. Everywhere in here in this room, in rooms at other IRIRs and NOGs and etc., you all have made the entire world closer, you've made it communicate better, you've made people freer, you've made it cheaper, easier, and better for me to talk to family and friends all around the planet. And this is like, uh, like world changing and, and honestly touches me in ways that uh, I really think is important to humanity. So my question is, why wouldn't I want to be associated with something like that? Why wouldn't I want to help make that better? And that's why I want to do this. Excellent. Thank you, Cap Patrick. Someone else like to speak? Why, what's your motivation to give up so much personal time? Bram, no, go ahead. There we go. Um, that's funny, when I was uh, at, at, at NISP, I used to sit on these, these sort of industry technical fora and it was way worse, right? We used to have to try and work out very detailed specifications for all kinds of stuff. And I'm, usually I was only the, one of the only lawyers on the call. Um, Maybe there was one or two others, and I'm trying to craft this stuff. And not a few times, people said, "Like, Bram, what's the point? Why are you doing this?" And the, you know, the point was there weren't that many people from our side who were willing to show up, and um, you know, it was kind of fun. So why wouldn't I do it again? And you know, when I when I made notes for this, I you know, I kind of jotted down three things. And one is it kind of relates to that. I guess I'm a, I'm a bit of a tech policy nerd, and I found that in the past, you know, thinking about those things broadly. Uh, being in, in different domains of tech policy and so on has really helped me contribute to finding solutions that 
borrow from one domain and contribute to another, and I'd, I'd love to be able to do that and help Stuart forward an organization that um, has hit on some remarkable ways of doing things and has been pretty resilient as the internet grows and scales and becomes critical to governments and businesses and is still pretty open and pretty not so fragmented, which is still kind of an amazing thing. Okay, excellent. Um, Catherine or Bill, are you excited about going next? <laughs> okay. Go ahead, I'm, Catherine. Thanks. Yeah, I think it was uh, Lucy Moore who said we're all special kinds of nerds here, and I, I, I feel that this is a community that I could contribute to. I, am, I have just come off two other boards, so I have some time. I'm a professor, and that means I spend a lot of time inside a university. I talk to students, I talk to industry, I'm outward looking I, in policy environments, but I'm really looking for opportunities become, to become more engaged and to find a community where I can continue the sort of work that I've been doing over the past 20 plus years, which is trying to make the internet a better place. The focus that I've had in the past has been and continue to have is really around digital inclusion, around access to the internet. I, I've been at the Canadian regulator with some of the people at this table. And it's, it's really about, I, contributing to a community, uh, continuing to provide community service, and coming to this organization in part because the nominating committee invited me to be here and because I've got the governance skills that, uh, that Aaron is looking for. Excellent. I know Jacob is an anxious to go, <laughs> so I was going to bring him up now. Uh, let's hear from Jacob. I've let my name stand as a nominee for Aaron's Board of Trustees because I genuinely believe in the open, multi-stakeholder internet. I've spent my entire professional career working for it and the betterment of it. And so I want to continue to be able to do that, not just professionally, but in my uh, extracurricular activities. And, and so I really I hope that I can get your support in that effort. It's something that I've spent my whole career caring about and thinking about. Got it. Bill, do you want to comment on why so much, why you're interested in spending so much time on such uh, activity? Sure. So I realized as soon as Patrick spoke or started to speak that this was probably the question that I should have volunteered to go first on and yet I'm, I'm here last. And the, and the reason why that is is I think that a lot of us in this room are, are very similar in the, the types of things that we, we like to do and what we like to spend our time on and dedicate our time to. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I've enjoyed this community for the past 10 years and would like to continue to do so. It's contributing to great causes that affect great number of people all around the world with people who I quite frankly enjoy spending my, my time with. I mean. I had the same word written down on my notes as Patrick, like who wouldn't want to do this if these are the types of things and the types of people that you like to spend your time with. Um, I'm proud of the advancements and of the hard work that, that this organization has done for the past uh, 10 years while I've been involved, some on the AC and some on the board, but there's still a lot that needs to get done, uh, particularly in some of the areas that we've already discussed in terms of the reform of the governance of our organization, uh, an election and non-com system that many view is completely broken. Um, and other initiatives as it relates to routing security that we spoke about, IRR and issues around RPKI. So I have the time uh, to dedicate to Aaron's mission and these causes. The people who I do it with are amazing people who I enjoy spending time with. And you know, who, who wouldn't want to be in these shoes? Excellent, thank you. I'd now like to move on to our uh, next question, uh, which is, what actions, if any, are appropriate for Aaron to take on behalf of an IP resource holder whose addresses are announced by an ASN that has no authorization or authority to do so? The announcement may be accidental or intentional. Why don't we hear from Jacob first this time uh, on what actions are appropriate for Aaron to take on behalf of an IP resource holder whose addresses are announced by an ASN that has no authorization or authority to do so? 
The question about what Aaron should do if addresses are announced inappropriately, I think is fundamentally a question that management ought to have a point of view on and that management should develop policies on through the policy development process that are ultimately ratified by the board. I don't think actually you want board members who are predisposed to have a particular point of view on very specific policy areas like this that are really uh, the rightful domain of the community and the policy development process. But if you want my point of view in general on dispute resolution policies, I think they have to be uh, fair, I think they have to be unbiased, and I think they have to be swift. So that's something that we learned when I was at SIRA uh, 15 years ago, is that when we um, revised the CDRP, one of the things that we revised it around is making sure that disputes could be resolved in a swift way. And that's really important here because resources uh, can't be announced improperly for any extended period of time. That can't be acceptable. And so there has to be a very, very swift way for Aaron to take action, both in the short term and ultimately through a fair adjudicative process that has long-term ramifications. But what that means precisely, as I say, I think is really up to Aaron's community through the proper policy development process. Okay, we've heard from Jacob, but a board member, another board member, another candidate. Sorry, you're not members yet. Would another board candidate like to opine? Yes, Catherine. I'll go because I, I have a quite similar answer, I think, to Jacob's. So I think the technical question is not a question for the board of trustees, but I think what the board of trustees needs to understand is the the risk inherent in the action that's taken. I am, there, there needs to be an assurance that the action or the choice not to act at a given time or the timing of the action, the management needs to be very clear as to the reasons that it makes the decisions that it does. The board needs to understand and assess the potential risk that goes along with that. I am, I, I think as well, there are precedents to consider, uh, best practices in other regions, and there's strong advice, as Jacob said, from the community, I think particularly from the technical and legal expertise uh, in the, within the organization. So from my perspective, I, I think the answer here is not what my own opinion is. My answer is really how does the organization as a whole ensure that it comes up with the best response to this particular situation. Okay. What another board? Uh, I see you ready to go, Bill. Bill, what's your opinion? So I'm going to flip it and go the other way. I'm going to say that first and foremost, I obviously believe that actions and, and standpoints that, that Aaron takes on things should be vetted by the community and we should be carrying out our mission in a way that is directed by the community. That goes without saying with regards to any of the answers to any of the questions. Um, on this particular one, my view as if, if I was uh, participating in the community on this is that um, I think that our community has very widely varied views on how far Aaron should go in this regard. Uh, some might believe that uh, Aaron shouldn't be involved at all in this type of thing. Others might believe that Aaron should have a heavy hand in this regard. Personally, I don't think that it's our mission or it's our time or place to be out there policing the internet. Um, however, I do believe that once again, uh, regardless of whether or not um, an announcement of this nature is accidental or intentional, that Aaron should take uh, a lead role uh, in terms of education and advocacy to, in, to help its community members and stakeholders um, configure their networks in such ways that these types of announcements don't happen or have less of an impact when they do happen and uh, can direct their community members and stakeholders slash customers to resources that can assist them when something like this happens. But I, I just can't see where we have the time and resources or where it's our mission to be, be actively policing the internet for accidental or intentional routing announcements. Okay, thank you. Anyone down at the far end of the candidate pool? Yes, Patrick, go ahead. So like with the first question, the first thing I did is like, uh, what if any are appropriate actions? Well, 
today the appropriate actions is nothing. We don't have a policy to do this. Um, but maybe we should have one. Uh, just like everybody else said, it should go through the PDP, et cetera. But I'm going to disagree slightly with some of them. The board should not uh, enact policy and should enforce policy down the community's throat. But the board is part of the board's role is to ensure that the corporation is financially sound, is following the law, and several other things. This policy or policies in this vein have a huge, huge, huge risk of creating problems for Aaron as a corporation. You could do something that could get you sued, you could do something that could hurt the internet, you could do all kinds of things. And that's one of the things that the board is supposed to consider before rubber stamping something that went through the PDP, even if it went through properly. So I think that there are things that we can, as Aaron, do, but they are light touch. As I said in an answer to the first question, we have no operational role, we can't like do anything. I personally, as a member of the community, not as a member of the board, am, not sure that I am in favor of, for instance, revoking all the IP space if you accidentally announce something that you shouldn't have and things like that. So that leaves us doing things like RPKI and the IRR and trying to show the community the correct way to do things and letting them do the filtering or whatever else it is. But mostly I want to be clear that um, while policy should start with the community and come through the AC and the normal PDP, this is the type of thing that I think the board should take a very, very, very close look at before allowing to um, become an actual rule because of the risk to the corporation. Um, and I just, I feel that's my role as a board member. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, Bram, I saw you nodding. You want to opine on the same question? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we've heard a pretty good range by now. I think literally my notes, some of them are word for word, you know, we should, uh, the role of the board is to act in Aaron's best interests and fulfill its fiduciary duty, not to substitute its policy thinking for the members or of the PDP. So, you know, the question again is, so fine, so what would I be looking for as a member of the board if this sort of thing happened? And I think, I think Patrick's got it right in the sense that, you know, you go back to the mission of the organization, you go back to the articles and the bylaws, and you say, like, what is the role of Aaron? You want to be really careful about not going outside of those in a way that could cause real risk. Um, Aaron has had great success in doing things that are related to standard setting or standard adopting, really, following the lead of actual standard setting organizations, um, working with IRR, working with RPKI. And I think, you know, if anything, it's an interesting question in terms of uh, what kind of transparency, what kind of informational tools could Aaron consider engaging in, given the resources, um, to be able to sort of ensure that when this sort of thing happens, it's easily detectable. Uh, to ensure that it's brought to the attention of the community who will act outside of the Aaron uh, uh, um, context, I suppose, uh, to do something about it. Um, it also means maybe, you know, it's, it's a provocative question, as, as you've seen from the answers, and, you know, things like tabletop exercises where you actually cooperate with other organizations and say, look, let's say this happens tomorrow, who's calling whom and what are you going to say is not a bad way to, to go about uh, uh, thinking it through as members of the community in terms of inputting into the policy development process. Okay, thank you. Um, we actually are done now with the first three questions. We have prepared a fourth question, but we're also uh, just under 200 seconds from break. So the question is whether or not I take into your coffee and cookie time so you can get a little more information from the board members. If you don't wanna hear them for the next five or 10 minutes, Break is outside, you can go. I'm gonna continue the forum though for one more question. Wait, so, wait, we don't get cookies? Uh, I live on coffee. Um, so let's start I'll note out. that you promised cookies this no morning. No one told me that when, and I, when I went inside, in there was no cookies. I will make sure you get a cookie, Patrick. Okay, our last question which we've prepared is, what is your vision on Aaron's role in the global RPKI and view on RPKI trust anchors. And I guess we'll start out with Jacob because we know he's ready. And the last question is about RPKIs. And I'm not going to lie to you, if you want somebody who is a global expert on RPKIs, you should not vote for me because that is not me. So I can tell you that what I think about this technology in general? Is that anything that increases the security of ultimately internet users by increasing the reliability and security of routing is a good thing. And if there are specific issues related to it, again, I think those are really not properly the domain of the board in itself, but rather things that ought to be addressed through the appropriate 
processes within the community and the policy development process. And then ultimately for Aaron's uh, leadership to shepherd through those processes and to bring to the board for ratification, not for the board to have preconceived ideas on how those kinds of policies should be dealt with. Okay, we've heard from Jacob. Or board member Patrick, you want to go ahead? Uh, so, uh, personally, I believe all of the RIRs have a vital role to play in RPKI. Um, it's, it, we have a unique position where we can tell who owns what block, and that's kind of vital to RPKI. Uh, so I think Aaron um, has a role to play, and I think it's important that we do that. Personally, and again, not as a board member, personally, I would love if the TAO was just put out there for free. I, I, that would be best, in my opinion, from the operator standpoint. Um, some of you got know a guy named Job Snyders. Uh, we're actually on a, another board together, and we're good friends, and I cannot tell you the number of hours he has explained to me why it is stupid what Aaron is doing. Unfortunately, uh, based on my last answer, you've probably noticed that I uh, really do care about the risks associated with um, doing something to the corporation. Is this an existential threat to Aaron? While we're vital to RPKI, if we get sued out of existence, we can't do RPKI or anything else. So when legal counsel tells the board this is an existential threat to the organization, it is possible for the board to go, well, we don't care, we're gonna do it anyway. That is absolutely within our purview. But it's not something that we take lightly. I think that the recently um, updated uh, RPA was a good step, but it was a small step, and I'm going to push, and we're going to research, and we're gonna see how we can make it closer to completely free. But I do not think that's gonna happen tomorrow because I, I really do believe that we have to protect Aaron first as a corporation, and then we can um, do the best we can to provide the services that the community needs. It's not the other way around. We don't just do everything and then go, oh, well, if the corporation goes away, too bad. So that's how I feel about it. Okay, thank you. Someone else like to opine? Yes, Brown. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, clearly Aaron has a critical role to play in RPKI. He's one of the five uh, regional registries. Um, but it's also sort of an interesting example that really points up some of the tensions and some of the, some of the skill sets that, that you need in all this. I mean, you know, one role is to ensure that Aaron facilitates global implementation of RPKI in cooperation with its partners in a standards-based manner and so on. And that's something that is a step towards improving routing security. Another, one of the other questions we had, it's clearly a top of mind. Um, so facilitates global implementation at the same time Another role is to ensure that it has its eyes open, that it understands its risk, and that it's understanding its stakeholders, including members of the community, understand their risk. And that's also important. And there's a third one, which is it's got to balance implementing everything it does in a way that's friendly to small players and doesn't require an army of developers or an army of lawyers to implement. Um, and I say this is you know, an example of both good and bad, because each of these things have been done in good ways and sometimes in not so good ways. Um, and it's a tough thing to do. One of the challenges has been whether the right balance has been struck in doing all these things. Part of the very vigorous debate has been about saying, well, maybe the right balance has not been struck. Let's shift things a little bit and so on. Um, I've spent you know, my career as a lawyer advocating for plain language drafting and user experience design and all that fun stuff as part of, uh, uh, you know, I guess, many younger lawyers okay. are now doing. And so uh, you know, all I can say is this is a familiar problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, Catherine, Bill, either of you? All right, I'll try and be a little uh, quicker, acknowledging that Catherine and I are all that are holding you from uh, coffee and original sea salt vegetable chips. Um, I read this question and I, I viewed it a little bit differently. I looked at this question and said, wow, there's Job's question. Okay. Um, and in, you know, in the vein of John today, I'll throw my own little bad joke in. And I'm going to say, the question is, what is your vision on Aaron's role? And I'm going to say, Aaron plays a key role in the global RPKI. Okay? I won't elongate the answer much longer other than to say, I simply, simply put, I think that we need to find a way to make our towel more readily available without some of the barriers that exist today while effectively managing the risk to the organization. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I, I really agree with what's been said by everyone else. There's very clearly a risk <coughs> here. There's very clearly a demand within the community. There's a gap between the two. You can't just ignore that gap. I am, it seems like a solution for this is absolutely essential, and 
I think this is an organization and a community that has the wherewithal to figure out what that solution should be. And if I can help contribute to that in any way, then here I am. Thank you. Uh, we've heard from our candidates on all four questions of the candidate forum. I'd like a round of applause for the candidates, including Jacob, our remote. <laughs> Elections will open shortly. Um, actually, uh, now, right? Elections are now open. So, uh, if you have not uh, started voting, go forth and start doing that. We're going to take a break now. We're going to be back here at 3.30. Uh, and I look forward to seeing everyone at that time. So we're on break till 3.30. Thank you, candidates.